So good to have each and every one of you here with us this morning as we begin a brand new study in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, we're going to be following up, of course, the book of Job. So if you go in your Bible, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. So just keep going to the left in your Bible, about four books, and you'll find the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll beginning begin we will be looking today at the first two chapters. So we'll start in, in chapter one, verse one this morning. But before, as always, we begin the study of God's word with prayer, uh, I would invite you at this time to lift up whatever might be troubling your heart to God, wherever you are. God is there with you, just as He is here with me today at this time. So I would just invite you to lift up your prayers to Him as I lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise Your name. Lord, we thank You for this day that You've given us. Lord, that we can come here together, that we can open your word together, Lord, that we can be assured, we are reassured by you and your word that, that you are here and present with each and every one of us, that you were, we ask, Lord, that you would guide our hearts as we look at your word, help us, Lord, to understand it, first of all, and Lord, then help us to learn how to apply these, these timeless truths that we're going to see today in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would guide our lives, Lord, also, as we have things that are, are troubling us today. We have many who we love who are ill. Lord, we, we ask for your healing for them, whether that be a physical healing or whether it be emotional or whether it be psychological, Lord. We ask that you would provide the healing that each and every one of our loved ones needs. Lord, we know that you're able to do all things. So we're not afraid to ask you to do these things that seem too much for man. But Lord, we also ask that your will be done. Because Lord God, we know that your will is what is always best for us. Lord, guide us, we ask. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1, the, the author identifies himself. He says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, we, I could give you a long exegesis of that, but just to boil it down, it's assumed by most biblical scholars that this book is written by King David's son Solomon, who succeeded David to the throne of Israel. Solomon was king of Israel circa 970 to 930 B.C. We know from the Septuagint, which is the translation into Greek of the Old Testament scriptures, that the word Ecclesiastes is Greek for preacher, as it's translated in the New King James Version, or teacher, as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible. Now, I'm going to use both of those translations uh, as I teach today. Uh, sometimes I think that Solomon is more preaching to us, and sometimes I think he's more teaching us, okay? So I, I would... I would invite you to, to be patient with me there as I switch back and forth between those two words. Solomon apparently searched diligently to understand the real meaning of life. This book was probably written toward the end of Solomon's reign after he had turned to pursuing the ways of his pagan wives as we read in 1 Kings chapter 11. And we, we may see that some, some fitting knowledge there that he had picked up as he followed the ways of those pagan wives also. So as we come to Ecclesiastes 
we, we understand, first of all, that, that humans seek an enduring meaning to life. We ask ourselves, what is this all about, ultimately? Now, Solomon is considered by secular historians to be one of the wealthiest people who has ever lived. Now, Solomon was king of Israel. So you got to keep in mind that the money he was spending was the money of the nation of Israel. Solomon had it all, at least from a worldly perspective. He was able to explore every avenue of human pleasure and every avenue of human possessions. But Solomon found out that satisfaction of every worldly desire and passion cannot answer our deepest need to find an enduring purpose for which we exist. In the 19th century, there is a, the 19th century A.D., there was a German philosopher named Friedrich Nietzsche. He espoused nihilism, and he touted the death of God as its inevitable result. Nihilism is the extreme opposite of Judeo-Christian or biblical worldview that human life is real and enduring and has value and meaning. Nietzsche eventually suffered a complete mental breakdown. And he died about 11 years after writing his expose on nihilism. The sciences of archaeology and anthropology confirm the biblical explanation that people of all time have had a sense of our own mortality, but also People of all time have a sense of our transcendence or existence beyond our lives on this earth. But without a personal knowledge of the eternal God, a fuller understanding of this transcendence is not possible. There's been no one who's come back from the grave to tell us what's on the other side what that experience was like. Ecclesiastes shows that around 940 B.C., Solomon conducted a grand experiment, searching far and wide in an attempt to experience everything life has to offer. After all, he had experienced, learned, and done Solomon declared that it was all vanity or futility, meaningless, transitory, and of no lasting value. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we see by looking at Solomon's writings that he thinks that life can seem pointless. And he's he's seeking answers to that that feeling and that understanding. In verse 1, the words of the preacher, the Hebrew word translated preacher, is found nowhere else in the Bible. (laughs) The meaning can refer to a public speaker, an assembly leader, or a teacher. In reference to King Solomon, the word indicates this book does not consist of his decrees, but rather his personal philosophy on life, his personal admonitions, and his counsel particularly particularly to the young members of the upper class in Israel's society at the time. Verse 2 in chapter 1 says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, That phrase, all is vanity, represents the main theme of this entire book. 
All human attempts to make life meaningful apart from God are ultimately futile. The Hebrew word translated vanity or absolute futility, as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible, carries a broad spectrum of meaning. Let's look at that really quick because we're going to see it again and again and again in this book. The Hebrew word literally means vapor or breath. It denotes the fleeting, visible vapor produced by a person's breath on a cold winter day. Hence the term can mean fleeting or transitory, futile, worthless, or meaningless. It can also carry an understanding of incomprehensible or enigmatic In the context of the book, the word expresses the idea that the mystery of life cannot be stated in simplistic terms. A reality that any attempt to find meaning in life apart from a relationship with the living God will always result in futility. Any quest for meaning in life apart from God is an absolute waste of time. Let's come down to verses 3 through 4. It says, What profit has a man from all of his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away, and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Here Solomon questions the gain or the profit of all the work all that we work so hard for in this world. This is an economic term, hence the word, the translation profit in the New King James, or gain in the Christian Standard Bible. The words under the sun are used also in this book very, very often. That is an ancient idiom for a finite human lifetime. Human life on earth by itself is transitory, a never-ending parade of generations, one generation following the other. In stark contrast, the physical earth in which humans reside maintains a relative permanence. The marks of man swiftly fade away. In other words, as it says there, the earth abides forever. Man puts little potholes down, but the earth very quickly covers it over. Let's go go now to verses. Let's go go now to jump on down to verse 8 in the text. Now I'm going to read verses 8 through 11, and then we'll go through those verses one at a time. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has has been is what will be, and that which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, See, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Well, let's just look at that for just a minute. First of all, in verse 8, Solomon says, All things are full of labor. That means that everything worthwhile in life comes by hard work. And this is, in, this is exactly God's judgment against mankind's sinfulness in Genesis 3, 17 through 19. I'm going to read just a few things so you'll be reminded of what God said that was brought on every human being by our personal sins. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. 
In verse 19, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. That is what life is about because of human sin. Man cannot even put into words the difficulty of life and how hard we have to work to obtain just the necessities of life and even more the things we want in addition to that. Because of the continual turmoil or toil in life and its setbacks, a person can develop a dreary and even fatalistic view of life. The person seeking to fill the void in his life is never satisfied by his own efforts. Such a person is seeking always to hear a good word, something new and encouraging. But look at verse 9. That which has, has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be, de, be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Let me repeat that. There is nothing new under the sun. The world searches for its own answers. But there is nothing that is really new. And there is nothing that will fill the void that we, feel, feel, that we have in our lives by human effort. People living today experience the same joys and sorrows of Solomon's time and with relatively minor variations. Now, people today who call themselves progressive are only rehashing the same problems and forcing society to relive the same painful lessons of all past generations. There is nothing new under the sun. And unless we learn from what has already been done and the mistakes that have already been made, we are doomed to repeat those. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, tells us that human perspective in this world is limited. Look at verse 12. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. The king of Israel during this time period was in a particularly good position to teach wisdom to his readers. In his day, Solomon, listen to this, Solomon was the most powerful man on earth, controlling the land trade routes between Egypt and Africa and between Europe and the Far East, as well as the oceanic trade routes via Phoenician ships that went all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, through the Straits of Gibraltar, all the way up to the British Isles, and all the way to the, down the west coast of Africa. Solomon, in 1 Kings chapter 10, 14 through 23, was considered one of the most wealthy individuals, and still is today, just by the count of the amount of gold that he received in tribute, he was the most wealthy individual probably who has ever lived. And hence he was able to buy and obtain anything and everything that he desired. He was the king, the most powerful man on earth and the most wealthy man on earth. In the wisdom literature of the Bible, Solomon will later tell us in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, that the fear of God is the foundation for all true human wisdom. Let me say that again. The fear of God, the living God, the one and only living God, 
is the foundation for all true human wisdom. Here in Ecclesiastes, however, Solomon's quest centered on his own efforts of learning from personal experience. From this limited perspective, Solomon found only enigmas that he could not resolve on his own. Look at verse 13. Solomon says, And I set my heart to seek to seek, and to search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. We, uh, we've all heard the saying, knowledge is power. This assumes that the more you know, the more you achieve, and the more you can achieve, and the more power you have. Yet here was one of the wisest men and most wealthy of men who has ever lived telling us that what that he had applied his mind and examined and explored all that is done under heaven. He made an all-out effort to do this, and he had the resources to do it. Solomon had devoted himself to the pursuit of wisdom. In 1 Kings 3, 5 through 9, we see that wisdom was Solomon's one request of God when he was very, a very young man and he became king. This verse indicates that when Solomon set out on search for meaning in life, he did so without the guidance of God. That was much later in his life. Solomon was seeking the world's wisdom on this matter. Wisdom is the appropriate wisdom by definition. So you can see it right there on your screen. Wisdom is the appropriate wisdom application of knowledge. We find knowledge, but it's not wisdom yet unless we can take that knowledge and apply it appropriately in our life. Solomon writes as if God either does not care or God wants man to busy himself throughout his life with this search for meaning and worldly wisdom. Solomon may have been purposely writing from the perspective of the agnostic, or maybe in his quest for meaning to life, Solomon did not yet seek God's answer. In verse 13, Solomon sought, first sought to find meaning in life by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. At this point, Solomon is seeking the application of human knowledge as a source of fulfillment. It will only be later in this same book, Ecclesiastes, that Solomon will speak of seeking the understanding that comes only from the living God. Here, he is speaking of the kind of intellectual truths that leave God out. Note, in verse 13... Look at verse 13 there, and that word God. You see it? It's you, that, the, the Hebrew word behind that is not God's personal covenant name. Yahweh, or Jehovah. It is the name of the Almighty Creator, Elohim, that's used in Genesis 1.1. Now let's let's talk about what that means. Through the rest of Ecclesiastes, Solomon continues to use Elohim, not the name used by a person who has a close personal relationship with God, which is Yahweh or Jehovah, translated LORD in all caps in our Old Testament scripture. God's plan for someone who knows Him personally is for a rich and abundant life. We see that in the Old Testament in Psalm chapter 23, and we see it in the New Testament in John 10.10. 10. 
Okay, so it's in both Testaments that for the person that knows God personally and lives in relationship with God, that person is promised by God a full, rich, abundant life. Verse 14, Solomon writes, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. Remember, that's works that people do in their lifetimes here on earth. Okay, And indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. This imagery illustrates that one cannot fully grasp meaning of life by human ability or by utilizing resources under the sun. The notion that simply gaining more and more knowledge is the secret to life's meaning falls flat. Having achieved more wisdom than other people, Solomon discovered his personal quest for meaning through wisdom was hopeless. It was like grasping for the wind. You clench your hand after it and there's nothing there. Why did Solomon land on this conclusion? Look at verse 15. He says, What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. All wisdom in the world under the sun cannot fix the deepest problems of humanity caused by our sinfulness. No mortal individual has the ability to attain complete wisdom, to think one can do so is vanity. Complete and perfect wisdom is found only in and through a personal relationship with the Lord God. Verse 16, Solomon says, I communed with my heart, saying, Look, I have attained greatness and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. In 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 22, we read that King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. In 1 Kings 9, 23, we read, And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom. Now look at verse 17. This seems almost contradictory to that when it says that Solomon said he set his mind to know madness and folly. He tried things that he knew were failures. And he tried things that he knew were sinful in his own life. In verse 18, Solomon's conclusion, In much wisdom is much grief. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. You see the frustration that Solomon's experiencing when he's trying to use his own mind and experiences to find wisdom and to administer wisdom. Elsewhere in the New Testament, in about written in about 40 to 50 AD. Human wisdom is discounted. Look in 1 Corinthians 1.20. We see a note of sarcasm written by the Apostle Paul. He says, he writes, Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Sarcastic words because he says that they don't show up amongst those who do not know God. In Romans 1.22, we read, also written by the Apostle Paul, Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? The teacher's quest was an attempt to find meaning in life. Even though there is a definite advantage in wisdom over madness and folly, with much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. We often learn the hard way. There's a much easier path to wisdom and that's through the Almighty God in personal relationship with Him. Today with the internet, 
We live in a world that's just absolutely lost in trying to pursue human ideas and human solutions to all of its problems. The progressive media is filled with all kinds of events and social engagements and opportunities and promises for more glamorous and physical life. It, it may seem that people enjoying the best life are the young ones who have everything now and who stimulate themselves constantly with, with drugs and music and partying and sex. And Dr. Solomon says, he warns us, that only increases sorrow. Delayed gratification, earned as return for an extended period of hard work, seems in our day to be a thing of the past. As believers, we understand that there is wisdom that does not lead to despair. Those who have their, inside, their sights fixed within the parameters under the sun will never see it. The truly wise are those who know Christ Jesus. Jesus, for us, is wisdom sent from God. In 1 Corinthians 1, 24 through 25, Paul writes, But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, now to a, a Jewish man like, like Paul, he means... That means all people in the world, okay? All the Jews and all the Greeks. He says, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The progressives of this world, glory, in the pursuit of godly wisdom. They are going through this same exercise that Solomon went through 3,000 years ago. The wise man in the world came to boast in Christ Jesus as our Lord and our only hope We understand that as believers in Jesus Christ. Those who have found Christ Jesus are the ones who have found power over death and the true meaning of life. This eternal perspective gives meaning that wisdom in this world cannot obtain. Now let's come down to chapter 2 in Ecclesiastes. Let's look at verse 1. Solomon says, he writes, I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. But surely this was also vanity. When the pursuit of worldly wisdom failed to satisfy Solomon's search, he turned to sensual pleasures to find meaning in life. And we see this historically documented in 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 the book of 1 Kings. This is what many today call the good life. It denotes a life centered on self-gratification and materialism. Solomon discovered that this experiment was an empty life, a total failure. In verse 2, Solomon writes, I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? Solomon concluded that even laughter was madness. Now, we're, we're told by psychologists that laughter is, as a general rule, very healthy for us. However, life is very serious. Laughter is good only if it is appropriate for the situation that we find ourselves in. In many situations, Laughter shows a detachment from reality. Pleasure only brings a smile for a moment. Its value is extremely transitory. Excitement 
in any activity quickly fades and must be immediately replaced with another. The Hebrew word translated vanity, used 35 times in this book, can be translated futile, meaningless, or useless. The answer here to what Solomon is experiencing is the advice that Solomon should give is train yourself in godliness. For the training of the body has a limited benefit. But godliness is beneficial in every way since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. In verse 3, Solomon says, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what is good for the sons of men do under heaven all the days of their lives. Solomon turned to drinking to slow down his mind. Alcohol is a mind-slowing drug. Alcohol, alcohol did not help Solomon forget. Life is short, and there, there are ways, too many important things to accomplish, to waste it. The, the Apostle Paul wrote, And do not get drunk with wine, for it is dissipation but be filled with the Spirit of God. Drinking only dissipates our time to grow relationships and to do God's will in our lives. Other not mind-numbing drugs do the very same thing. Folly can be described as living on the edge of wisdom and living for excitement. In, in Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 17, Solomon talks about his his quest for acquiring personal achievements and personal possessions. In verse 4, Solomon says, I increase my personal achievement. <laughs> it renders the literal Hebrew construction, I made my works great. Solomon was noted for his vast building projects, fortifying defensive strongholds throughout his kingdom, a chain of forts with casemate walls and gates, the best that money could buy. In verses 4 through 8, here in this passage, Solomon lists houses, vineyards, gardens, parks, every kind of tree, reservoirs, male and female servants, slaves, herds of cattle and flocks, silver, gold, male and female singers, and many, many wives and concubines. In 1 Kings 3 through 10, it speaks of Solomon building 40,000 stalls for horses and chariots, 12,000 horsemen, all of these to be used in his army, a personal labor force for just for Solomon of 30,000 men, 70,000 porters, 80,000 stonecutters and 25 tons of gold. In 1 Kings 10, verse 23, it says, So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches. In Hebrew society, people viewed abundance of wealth as a sign of God's favor and blessing. We should view it as a blessing from God that Solomon or anyone could do such things. The only question is, what does God want me to do with those blessings? That's what Solomon did not understand. And he did not apply, obviously. In verse 4, he says, they were all for myself. In verses 4 through 11, he uses that phrase, myself, for myself, Eight times. In verses 4 through 11, he says, I, my, myself, and me, 37 times. Solomon's great wealth and possessions exceeded even those of his father David. 
But Solomon allowed paganism to turn his heart from using his blessings to serve God and God's people to be self-serving. As always happens, when a person turns from serving God to serving self, Solomon's morality and personal ethics were laid aside. In 1 Kings 11, 3 through 4, Solomon gave himself over to sexual passions, gaining over 700 wives and 300 concubines. In verse 8, Solomon joined the rest of the men of this world in viewing women as possessions and the entitlement of the rich. This is very consistent in our world today as well. Verse 11, Solomon concluded concerning personal achievement and wealth. All is vanity and grasping for the wind. There is no profit under the sun. Self-centeredness always ends in despair. God has placed the opposite as the second greatest commandment for people to live by. We see it in the Old Testament in Leviticus 19.18. We see it in the New Testament in Matthew 22.36-40. through 40. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus warned also of the seduction of wealth in Matthew 13, 22. Now as we come down to Ecclesiastes 2, 18, in the first half of that verse it says, Solomon says, Then I hated all my labor in which I toiled under the sun. Why do we get up each morning and go to work? Why do we do what we do? There's a sense of purpose that comes in working and producing and contributing to society. We also realize that work is not always easy or even enjoyable. Even still, work is good. It's fulfilling. In fact, work was given before the fall in Genesis 3 and was included in everything that God declared good before sin came into the world. We were originally created to work under and for God in a meaningful, fulfilling way. Our work was meaningful because it was part of God's plan for us, as we see in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. In the garden, God provided Adam and Eve with meaningful work, work to keep the garden, and with good food, freely eat of every tree in the garden except one. But work after the fall into sin was then under the sun. Difficult toil. After the fall in Genesis 3, we still strive to work meaningfully, but we are continually frustrated in this effort. It becomes futile or vanity because of our sinful hearts. In verse 18b, in verse 18a, I should say, note that word hated. Solomon said, then I hated all my labor. In Hebrew, that word hated does not refer to simply a strong emotional disdain. It includes a deliberate mental distancing from the hated object. It includes a shunning or an aversion as to an enemy. Objects of this kind of hatred in the Old Testament include enemies, persons, nations, wisdom, and even at times, the Holy God. You see how perverted we become in our sin. Under the sun, here again, refers to the realm of human activity on earth, and it implies a life lived independently of God. In verse 18b, we read, 
Solomon says, because I must leave it to the man who came after me. Why does God, why does Solomon hate the work that he's done during his whole life? Because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Now late in his life, Solomon was mentally distancing himself from a lifetime spent in toilsome work. But why? Because he had to leave it as an inheritance to the one who came after him. The teacher lamented that he had no control over his own legacy. Verse 19, And who knows whether he will be a wise or a fool? Solomon was troubled over the prospect that the fruit of his lifelong labor would be squandered by a fool than built upon by a wise man. Sounds like Solomon was too selfish to spend time with his own son. That Solomon's fears were well founded as a result. Scripture only lists one son for Solomon, Rehoboam, who succeeded him as the king of Israel. And in 1 Kings chapter 12, Rehoboam did indeed act as a fool. And as a direct result of some of his decisions, Israel very soon broke into civil war and split permanently into two nations, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Solomon's son would leave a permanently divided nation that David and Solomon had worked so hard to unite and lead to amazing prosperity under God. Verse 20, Solomon says, I turned my heart and despaired of all the labor in which I had toiled under the sun. Solomon experienced the predictable result of separating himself from God. He gave himself over to despair, which means an absence of hope. Solomon Solomon confesses, I turned my heart, and the result was I despaired of all the labor which I had toiled. He turned his heart from God to the world. Look in verse 21. The first half of the verse says, For there is a man whose labor is wisdom, knowledge, and skill. Solomon was likely referring to himself, but is showing the applicability of the same situation occurring in another person's life. Solomon had led the production of magnificent structures like the temple and his fortresses and his walled cities to protect his people. Wisdom here in this verse echoes God's approach to work. Psalm 104, 24 says, O Lord, and this is Lord in all caps. This is spoken by a person that lives in personal relationship with the living God. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possession. Knowledge is tied to a godly lifestyle a regular feature of wisdom literature. Skill <clears throat> has two aspects. The technical know-how of getting the job done right and successful management of the job all the way to completion. <clears throat> in, in verse 21, the second half of verse 21, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity, and great evil. Solomon was troubled by the fact that he had to give all the fruit of his life's work to someone who would not appreciate the effort that went into it. You see, the problem here is self-centeredness on the part of Solomon. Focus on the world as opposed to raising the next generation right. Raising his son and teaching him right from wrong and teaching him to live by faith and trust in the living God. For this reason, New Testament readers should have sympathy toward Solomon in his limited perspective. Coming to grips with death without this clearly espoused eternal perspective through Christ is itself an enigma. In the natural world, death is the enigma that no one has faced 
and live to tell about it. This is why bringing God and His work through Christ Jesus into the discussion makes all the difference in the world. In Christ Jesus, death becomes the gateway into the presence of God. For a Christian to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. To be present with the Lord is to enjoy eternal pleasures forevermore. In 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, the Apostle Paul reminded Christians that we are not to build our lives on foundations of gold and silver and precious stones and wood and hay and straw, straw, all the things that are under the sun. In the end, these things will not last and will be exposed as vain and futile. On the other hand, we are told to build on the eternal foundation of Christ Jesus and His kingdom, which will lead to an eternal reward which can never be taken away from us. Focusing on Christ Jesus leads to rewards that moths and rust cannot destroy. Matthew 6, 20. Now we come down to Ecclesiastes 2.22. For what has man for all his labor and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? Solomon was not asking what would become of his wealth such as, so, so much as what will become of me and my memory. Verses 22 through 23 tell us that his lifetime of work under the sun had resulted in grief-filled days, a sorrowful occupation, and anxious nights. In verse 23 it reads, For all his days were sorrowful, and his work burdensome. Even in the night his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. This is Solomon's conclusion about worldliness. Love of the world. In verse 24, Solomon writes, Nothing is better for a man than he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. Solomon is waking up. He's realizing that to make life on this earth Meaningful, he must live in relationship with the living God. Colossians 3, 23 through 24 reads, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Verse 25, Solomon says, For who can eat or who can have enjoyment more than I? Look, but look in verse 26. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. This is also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Now what he's talking about vanity and grasping of the wind there is the first part in verse 24. Who, for who can eat and who, who can have enjoyment more? Solomon's saying, well, of all the people who have ever lived, who, who should be able to enjoy life more than I? He says, I have all the money in the world. I can do anything I want and I have done anything I want. But he says, listen, the only person that's going to find satisfaction in his work and in gathering and collecting and doing work is the one who is good before God. In the book of Revelation we read of a meal called the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the end we shall see a provision of food and healing that will last for eternity in the new earth as God dwells among mankind in Revelation 22, 1 through 2. Therefore, eating and drinking here 
on earth is now simply a foreshadowing of eternal life, of eating and drinking in the presence of God that is to come. We must realize that everything that we have here is a gift of God. We are stewards of it. It is given to us for our use according to God's purpose. And if we do not use it according to God's purpose, then our life becomes vanity and grasping for the wind. God gave humans life and work as a means of joy, not despair. Despair arises when humans seek to enjoy life apart from God. We become worldly and not godly. As believers, we should enjoy our work, thanking God for His provision. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, we read, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we praise your holy name. Lord, these, these verses tell us much. Our, our minds right now are, are, are just a buzz, sorting through these things that Solomon says, lessons that, hard lessons that he learned, that we also have learned probably in our own lives as, as we've We've run into this feeling of, of emptiness and vanity in what we're doing in life. Lord, to, to realize that what we really need to do at these times is to, is to turn away from our worldly ways, to, to, to return to you, Lord, and to lay everything down before you that you've given us. To ask you, Lord, to show us your, your purpose in our lives and in the things that we do. Lord, we know that fulfillment will come only in finding that place, that purpose that you placed here for us individually, for each one of us individually, for me to find that purpose, for, for each one of us to find our personal purpose and to walk in life in relationship with you seeking your will each and every day and in each and every decision that we make in our lives. Lord, that is the place where we will be fulfilled. We will be preparing ourselves for an eternity with you and in the process, bringing the next generation to faith in you as well. Lord, guide us in this effort. Help us, Lord, to be successful. Empower us, Lord. Give us the wisdom to walk in your ways and to do your will. It's in Jesus' great name we pray. Amen.